Lisa. Hi. Hi, Ralph. Hello, everybody. I'd like to welcome you and thank you for coming to Bassey Live Conversations. Today's installment is Conversations in Commonality. Before I go any further, I want to let you know that all of your donations, proceeds from this event will be going towards the Kathy Grant Scholarship. We've already allocated funds for two scholarships to be awarded annually. So any other funds that we raise will give opportunities for other, grad, other prospective students to attend Bassey Education. I would like to take a moment to introduce my guests today, or my fellow panelists. I have Rail Isakowitz, Bassey owner and founder. Rail, would you like to say a few words to our audience? So happy to be here. Happy to be in your presence and honored to, be, uh, to have you as our moderator. Thank you. So it's a fantastic experience and thank you to everyone for attending. We really appreciate these conversations and these meetings. And my other guest today is Brian Westpoint. He's a social and wellness advocate. Brian, would you like to say a few words before we get started? Happy Wednesday, everyone. So glad to be here and have these, uh, have these conversations that are necessary. <laughs> yeah. Um, so the goals of these conversations is to, one, continue bringing to the forefront um, issues of social injustice, um, inequalities, especially as it pertains to the fitness industry. We want to keep these conversations going. We want you to participate. Um, send your comments to our social media, Facebook, and to our Instagram. I know we're filming on Instagram Live right now, so I know we have other people that are watching from our social media. Um, we have several other conversations that will be continuing throughout the year. And then I know, Rail, you've been on a whirlwind with this, our Bassy Live. Last week, it was with Roy. Mm -hmm. And then today we have this, and then on Friday you're doing another event. Can you tell us about that? Absolutely. So first, just going back to my interview of uh, last week, and I believe it's on our YouTube channel. Yes. It's really a, an interview worth watching. It's so interesting. It gives insight to uh, the struggles against injustice and apartheid in South Africa during the 40s and 50s. It is a biography of my Uncle Jock, my dad's brother, and my dad. Uh, they were involved in very much the same activities. It's fascinating. I learned so much, although I lived it with my dad all my life. Uh, Roy did exhaustive research. It, it's an incredible interview and so educational, fascinating, and a beautiful uh, springboard to this initiative, these discussions we're having today it started in South Africa in the 40s and the 50s. We are in the United States and on Friday I go back to South Africa uh -huh. uh, to raise money for a charity there. And it is, uh, I've called it Empowering Women. All the money is going to Empowering Women. That's exactly what it is. It's to raise women up, women that are underprivileged, that are sometimes suffering abuse. Uh, I read some of the testimonials oh, from this uh, yes, fund yesterday. Yes. It is incredible. So those who can attend, 100% of the proceeds uh, from the math class and the Q&A are going to, uh, I wish I remembered the name by heart, but I don't. I will, uh, I recited it this morning <laughs> and now I forgot it. But. Uh, Friday, I will give a full introduction about the fund. It's an incredible charity. Uh, again, you can find the information on our social media. And so it's, it's kind of going full circle for me. Having been born in South Africa, I live here, going back to South Africa, and to give back to the country of my birth. Well, we are very excited about that. And we hope you will join us again on Friday with Rael and his math class, which is always a, a unique experience, an exciting experience, but also the Q&A following it. And again, all proceeds will be going to the La City in ba La Balito. No. <laughs> see, this is where I'm bad, because I can't pronounce La it. La La Bota. Okay, see, this is why it's, uh, you need a South African to say it. <laughs> say it one more time for us. 
Let you, the screen went off. <laughs> <laughs> My cue card. <laughs> la sedi la bato. I said it wrong. I said both that. La sedi la bato. La sedi la bato. Great. So let's let's dive into this conversation now that we're all. I think we've embarrassed that ourselves that. enough. <laughs> So, um, you know, a lot of organizations have been moving towards diversity. It started with the affirmative action um, laws that came out, and now we find that we had a perfect storm, and that perfect storm being everyone home from COVID, witnessing the George Floyd um, murder, and then the Black Lives Matter protesting. And Brian, I wanted to bring you into the conversation because as the, one of the founders of the Black Lives Matter in San, in San Diego, how, you know, how do we keep the momentum going? We were at a peak where you sort in the news everywhere and all the time and people were always talking about it and it became not such a local movement but a global movement, but now we're all back in our little buckets, so to speak, or our pockets. So how do we keep this going? Yeah, you know, we, we have gone back a little bit, you know, to our to our little pockets, um, which was somewhat expected. It, it was really great to see the um, the unity uh, of the people, but it, it was also something that I think a lot of us could sort of watch and, and understand that it wasn't sustainable. Um, so now is the real fight, is what I like to call it. You know, not that that was fake or to say anything wrong about that, but this is the the the, the later rounds, the ones that are are, are really going to be the important ones. I think that we're in a, a good place, a better place for sure, just because it is at, still at the top of everyone's minds. And for me, the important, uh, the important minds that it's on is in institutional minds, you know, whether it be universities, you know, the workplace, um, you know, I think that's where the cultures really have to shift to, to make the change that, that we're going to have to see. So I think just having it sort of institutionalized, you know, knowing that racism exists and having that be the mindset in institutions. And I think then we, we can make the headway. So, you know, hopefully we can continue that on with uh, my help. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. And speaking of institutions and various business organizations, um, Tim Cook is the CEO of Apple. In 2013, he wrote an article in um, the Wall Street Journal, and he said that um, diversity was very important to him, and he wanted to move towards that in Apple, um, lower, middle, and upper management. But I'm going to read what he really wrote, and it was very interesting, because he said, people are more willing to give themselves when they feel that they, they themselves are being fully recognized and embraced. And that means a lot in a corporate environment. Rail, how does that feel for you as being the founder of Bassey? You know, in, in all honesty, uh, something that Brian said really uh, resonates with me, and that is that he hopes this will be long-lasting. Because often after atrocities like George Floyd, there's this outrage, but it is fleeting, and it passes. And... Um, it is in the fabric of my being uh, from the moment I can remember life. It was instilled in me that all people are equal. All people deserve dignity. And all people deserve respect. So in a conversation with Brian and myself yesterday, we were talking about politically correct. And we both said, politically correct, <laughs> all you need to do is respect. Have respect for people. And that respect needs to be authentic. And I believe that Bassey, uh, I founded Bassey in 1989, and Bassey is an extension of myself. And I so believe in respecting all human beings and that all humans deserve dignity and equality that really Bassey has always been about that. That is part of the ethos. It's part of the DNA of Bassey. So I think we need to, at times, recalibrate, as we did with the uh, Kathy Grant Scholarship, and we redefined it as being for an African-American woman and an African-American man, Kathy Grant being African-American, I've been giving scholarships, Bassey has been awarding scholarships, 
since the very beginnings. But I found it necessary to make even a stronger statement that Kathy was African American and it should go in her name to an African American woman and man. That is what she wanted. So we have always walked our talk. Uh, Bassi is a very, very diverse uh, community. All genders, religions, nationalities, uh, colors. Bassi is a rainbow. But uh, we, although it's diverse, we also share common values. So you call this commonality. It's not just diversity. It's finding commonality. Awesome. Can I take a moment to speak on that? I just think it's important. Um, I, I think what you're saying, Rael, is super important there, that you have been doing this fight for a very long time. You know, I've known you before George Floyd, right? So I've seen the work that you've been doing before George Floyd. But what, what interests me and what I was super, super proud of was the fact that you didn't say then, I've already done this and that, right? I, I've already done these things. Because a lot of people said that, oh, I, I don't need to do anything more. I, I have a black friend, right? Or I, you know, I hired a black guy yesterday, right? <laughs> but you, you still took the initiative and said, you know what, I'm doing a lot, but I got to do more, right? Because that's what we need more uh, now, Rail. Uh, we need more, right? We, we've all been trying, we've all been trying, but we need more. That's not enough. So I just think that that really has to be highlighted. Really starting to get. I, I appreciate that. I appreciate that. Absolutely, Brian. We cannot rest on our laurels. Definitely not when it comes to issues of social injustice, social inequality. We cannot, cannot. We always have to strive to be better. It's never enough. Never, ever, ever is it enough. I can never rest with that one. We always have to strive to do better all the time. Yeah, you've always said that you can only know better than what you've done the day before. I only know what I know from yesterday and I can only do better from that. And that's one of my guiding principles and I've learned that from you. Thank you. So, Brian, I'm going to bring, I wanted to ask you a question because when we talk about scholarships and creating opportunities, you know, for brown and black people, um, it's often perceived as a handout or sometimes it's perceived as disingenuous. What, what can we, how can we as a company um, help others understand that this is an opportunity, it's not a handout. We, we know that Pilates education is expensive. We know that one of the barriers to entry into this profession is the education. So how, how does that conversation evolve so that you know, people are more open and receptive to this? You know, as opposed to like kind of them feeling like it's going to be a handout or like you're just giving stuff away, yeah. Yeah, you're kind of meeting a quota, which we're not, no. you know, we're not obligated to. Yeah, well, you know, it's 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 kind of biased for me just because I know the intention as I was just speaking. I, I kind of, you know, I know Rail's intention. So, I, you know, I understand how to see through it. But but an interesting perspective would be from other people, you know, how are they able to kind of look in and say, hmm, you know, is, is this is this real or is he just doing this because of the climate right now? Um, right. Yeah. I don't, that's a good question. Uh, you know, I would say number one for me would just be the effort that is put into it. So just what you're able to show. So, uh, you know, anyone can think anything from the surface, but I think just the, the, the integrity that you guys are, are, are giving the, 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 the scholarship away with, I think that'll kind of show through because I think from the outside, I know I'd be skeptical, right? When I hear things like that, I am skeptical. Okay, let's see what this is, right? You know, you know, you, you've seen this a lot. So, I, you know, I understand the skepticism, but with the integrity that goes on up there, I've seen it, I've felt it. So I think that it'll dissipate quickly <laughs> with that, if there is any initially. <laughs> so let's, let's dive even deeper because we know that the fitness industry as a whole is very biased. And one of the reasons is that fitness itself, when people think about fitness, they think they have to be in shape, that it's about a body type, it's about a body look, and instead of it being about wellness, and Pilates is one of the industries that, I, I hate to say, is leading that image of having to be a certain type. And um, I know that there's a lot of times when people talk about doing Pilates, they're like, I need to get in shape to do Pilates. Mm -hmm. Well, what is that about? 
You know, you know I, I, I think it, it, honestly, it comes from the early days, not the early, early days of Pilates, but the early days of the uh, surge in popularity. So much of that was based on hype, was based on celebrities, and was based on dancers. Mm -hmm. And you know, the, the dance uh, industry is steeped in certain um, images. You need to look a certain way. You need to behave a certain way. You need to be a certain weight. And if you did not fit into that mold, you couldn't be an answer. Uh, very sad for me to say, but in the early days you had to be white. And thank God that uh, mold was broken and shattered by people like Kathy, who did so much to shatter those molds. So it's those early days of dance together with celebrities, together with a certain image, together with a certain mold, so people, all they saw Pilates, and then they would show certain celebrities and dancers. And let's face it, Pilates has been probably 95% female dominant. So certainly men felt uncomfortable doing Pilates. And, you know, Joseph Pilates was a man. And by all accounts, not my account, but account, first-hand accounts from him, he created the system thinking it would be for men. Exactly. And I, luckily we had women that kept the flame alive <laughs> because if it was left to men, there would be no Pilates today. So, but we need to shatter those images because body shape, body type, color, weight, fitness level, age, None of those things should be barriers, and finances should not be a barrier. So we need to shatter those barriers, and, and I've always believed that, and I've always tried to do my best. I can always do better, but uh, I gave a workshop, uh, Pilates for Men, <laughs> and I, uh, I think it was a successful workshop, and one of the participants came to me afterwards. He said, I learned so much. But I got to tell you, you fell short in one way. I said, and what was that? He said, well, I was in the waiting area. There was not one magazine I could relate to. They were all about women's fashion and, and there was nothing for men. <laughs> and so you didn't, provide, you didn't create an environment we that go. welcomed men. And, and we need to be aware of that. Since then, I, I improved. Yes, I can tell you, we have plenty of magazines now for yeah. men and women. <laughs> I'm enjoying a lot of the fender bender ones, so um, we definitely have a lot of that. The fitness industry remarkably has um, one example of a no-judgment zone, and I'm talking specifically about Planet Fitness, and that was their whole motto, no judgment. You know, no matter what you, no matter what shape you were in, what size, whatever, you were welcomed in that environment. And Brian, being one of our wellness advocates, how's, you know, do you see that in other areas in the fitness industry? I know you participate in other activities. Yeah, it, it's very interesting to hear y'all speak about uh, the Pilates world, because although I'm not very, you know, learned in the Pilates world, I've taken a class or two, uh, to, you know, which I very much enjoyed, real. But, uh, you know, more so for myself, it'd be yoga, it'd be cycling, um, you know, things like that. And even those two spaces, you know, even the, the yoga space is, you know, predominantly, you know, definitely female and, and, and white, truthfully. Um, the, the same with cycling. Um, the cycling space, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm the old brother out there a lot of times, you know. Um, so the, those are place, spaces that I, that I understand the, the lack of diversity. But the cool thing about everything that is going on now is that I've seen in those two particular spaces, that there is infrastructural change. That there is at the top, you know, they're looking at this like we have to get more people involved. And I think a, a, an important thing is that it's changing is before it was just like 
you know, hey, we have opportunities, come and get them, you know, they're not understanding that most people don't even have the resources to get to those opportunities, right? They don't have the networks, they don't have the finances. So now actually making the, the decision to actually, we're going to go and get and recruit and bring, you know what I'm saying? As opposed to, hey, we're here, no applicants. It's like, well, that's not really, you know, you know, make more of an effort, like we were saying before, right? We got to do more. So I love the fact that like the cycling clubs that I'm inclusive in, they are, excuse me, that I'm included in, they're being much more active in terms of making sure that they're being inclusive you know actively doing outreach to bring people in um, so that's really good to see so that, that's positive so um, I think a way to right so the, the way to do that is again at, at the top um, I mentioned yesterday that my affiliation with CrossFit and that you know the fact that they I've had this beforehand you know beforehand they had before George Floyd anything you could not be judgmental going in there you know the, the person that was in the quote-unquote worst shape or in the best shape, you know, they, they, their only requirement was to work hard and don't judge, right? But you got to work hard and don't judge. And working, part of working hard is, is not judging people, right? It's to be, it's to be less egotistical, it's to, it's to control yourself. So uh, I've been fortunate to be a part of those things. Yeah, it's very interesting that, you know, um, I was doing a lot of research and one of the main things that came up was that a lot of corporations we're saying, well, we're, we're going to work on diversity. But when it came to actually looking at how they were reaching people to bring in, they were falling short. So they were saying, yeah, but we want to invite, we want to hire, blah, 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 blah. But they lack the network and the resources to actually reach valuable applicants. And then they were like, well, we had no one apply or there was no one available. So therefore, we've done our due diligence when... Like Ryan said, it is it is more of an active. We really have to reach out. Be active. Yeah, we have to really be yeah. more proactive in yeah. this. The people are actively pushed away. You know, so they're actively being pushed away. So we can't just say, oh, come on, get us. You know, no, they, they have to literally be pulled. Yeah. Right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, especially in areas, in environments, and in, um, industries where they're not known or not welcomed or feel like they're not welcomed. It has to be really something that we're very actively engaging in the community. Mm -hmm. And, you know, the other thing about fitness is that fitness is perceived not as wellness. And I know you and Brian both are wellness people. You always look at things holistically as wellness. And in, you know, a lot of brown and black communities, it's not considered, fitness is considered a luxury. And again, I think only you two can talk to me about this, but how do we change that, that myth, that perception, where it's not about you know, the luxury of it, it's a necessity in life? It is, so I think it goes back to the healthy body, healthy mind, and I'm gonna extend that even further to healthy society. If we've got unhealthy people, and when I say unhealthy, I mean in body, mind, and spirit, mm -hmm. society is unhealthy. And that's why I believe strongly that the Pilates we do does not end at the four walls. It must seep out into society. We are changing society. We're not just changing bodies. That's really important. And it is about educating people because it's true. If people are struggling to put food on the table, the last thing they are going to think about is going to take a $150 Pilates session uh, to look more beautiful. No, that is the last thing on their mind. So uh, we need to reach out, educate people. That it doesn't have to be Pilates. It can be a walk. It can be a, a, a jog. It can be uh, just getting outdoors, feeling uh, fresh air. Uh, you can find ways of uh, achieving health and well-being, eating better, what you put into your body is important, and, and looking at those around you. And in terms of Pilates, we need to create pathways for people that do not have the finances to come. So we have the apprenticeship program. Right. And the apprenticeship program is a really good program to bring people in who cannot afford uh, regular Pilates. So they can come and take a session with a trainee, a student who has not yet graduated at a very much a steeply reduced rate. 
I'm proud of that program because it allows people to come in. Look, I said yesterday in a conversation between us, I would far rather teach someone for free who I know is appreciating every moment and soaking it in then get paid a lot for a private session by someone who really it equates to me babysitting for an hour mm. and, and, and you know just putting them through a workout so that they can say that they did a Pilates exactly. session yeah. and you know go and have their, their lunch or what. So you know there, there's, a, there's a place for everyone and I'm not being judgmental I'm just saying that after so many years of teaching What's important to me is that I spend the limited time I have left giving to those that it's going to mean something to them and create change in their lives. Brian, you also mentioned, I know we had a lot of a conversation yesterday, and um, you were also talking about the overall wellness in the communities. What other ideas can, we, can you offer or suggestions that you can offer that would help us reach the community and kind of um, get them involved. You know, this is, it's, it's really a matter of life and death right now for brown and black people. Well, I think the number one muscle that we have to train, you know, is the mind. We, we're gonna have to change the mindset, you know, just overall and, and how it is that we view wealth. Because this is what I really struggle with my, my, my whole life, frankly, is, is where is the line? Because I grew up in those environments. You know, it, it's why I'm such an advocate for health now, because that's literally the most unhealthy environment that you can live in. So like I had to live my life to be optimum health, right? Just to even to, to compensate for, for all that. But, you know, perhaps I, I don't know how to really explain myself, but when I go back, when I speak to colleagues who might still in those environments, you know, it, it, the hardest thing to change is the mindset. You know, the mindset is that that's not important, you know, that, that, that it's not a priority. And I get that because of everything that's going on, I understand that I've lived it literally, but it's, it, it's still important, you know? So how do we still get this message across? It's something that I am struggling with and that I, I am looking for the way, but I know we're going to have to change the mindset. I, I'm just, I'm unsure of, of figuring out how that is, you know, how do you change someone's mind? <laughs> it's kind of, you know? Yeah. I'm open to suggestions. <laughs> well, I, I think one of the ways is that we must reach out to communities uh, that are underprivileged. I, I and say that in, in uh, the sincerest of ways. I, I wish there was a better word. It, that they are financially challenged and they cannot uh, see. Uh, health and well-being in the same way because they are just struggling to put food on the table. So one of the things we've done in Bassi is try to go to communities like that and offer uh, Pilates training, mat work training to people. So we did it with a dance company called The Wooden Floor. Yes. Yeah. And that is for an underprivileged community. We gave four of the students uh, scholarships to do our full mat training. And actually the faculty, the Bassi faculty, stepped up and uh, trained the people for free. They didn't uh, ask pay for those hours. And they went through a training. Now, my hope is that they will then go out into the community and teach the mat work and teach this holistic approach to the body, to well-being. It's not only how many push-ups you can do, but it's about leading a more healthy life. And we need to uh, create platforms for that. I think there's some amazing athletes that are doing that. LeBron James, he gives, so, he gives so much. He gives back to the community in whatever way he can to educate and to lift up, lift people up. That's what we need to do. We need to lift people up. Yeah, so we're back to that reach one, teach one philosophy, which I spoke to you about. So we're both, it seems like the three of us together right now, we're like, we need to change the messaging. We need to reach out to these communities. Um, during COVID, it seems like even more challenging because everyone is not able to go out. And at the same time, we all know that we're suffering from Zoom fatigue. 
you know, we're online working, you know, we're online with meetings, we're online with our family, we're online for education. So now we have an additional barrier to that wellness to combat. So again, you know, we're ta- I'm just throwing barriers out, questions and, and hoping through conversations like this, we can help not only ourselves, but our community and our uh, fellow professionals to find answers so that we can continue moving forward towards a wellness. Well, you know, Stella, I, I will say uh, that uh, I love the, <laughs> the phrase Zoom fatigue. Uh, and I, I feel Zoom fatigue having been on Zoom today for about six hours. But saying that, let's look at the glass half full. Zoom or any online platform, that could be the answer. Because mm-hmm. then people don't have to come to the studio. We can reach communities. That is what has been so amazing with online education. I myself have been, uh, uh, although we used online before, I became so inspired by how many people we can reach at the same time with online uh, platforms. And that actually may be the answer. Uh, Yes, we may feel fatigued, but we can reach people as long as they've got a way, as long as they have got a screen in front of them, They can turn it on, it can be a phone, a tablet, and a computer, and we could start offering classes to anyone. I mean, we can reach out to communities, Mm -hmm. and uh, that may be the way to do it, because to bring people to the studio is tough. Yeah, it's it's tough on the best of times. Tough on the best of times. And even more challenging now. So, Rel, you've, you're more familiar with um, Joseph and his philosophy, I, and, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, I remember reading somewhere that he was hoping Pilates would actually be part of physical education for, stu- for children. Can you speak more about that? Because I think that's another void that Pilates itself has not been able to fulfill. Uh, you know, he, he didn't write very much. And by the way, today is Joseph Pilates' birthday. So shout out to Joseph Pilates. Happy birthday, Joe. We all love you and uh, we cherish what you have given us. Joseph Pilates didn't write very much. He did, by many accounts I have heard, first-hand accounts, want Pilates to be done by everyone, mm-hmm. and certainly had a passion for it to be introduced into schools. And yes, physical education, physical activity is lowest on the totem pole. And I'm not talking about sport. Sport is an extracurricular activity that kids can do. It's often competitive. I am talking about movement, exercise for well-being what Joseph Pilates intended Pilates to be. And he did want that. He, uh, you know, I tried to draw out of John Steele uh, more about his personal conversations with Joseph Pilates. It seems as if certainly in his conversations with John Steele, it was very single track. And it was very much about (laughs) contrology and that everyone needs to do contrology. How much... His emphasis was on getting it into the schools. I cannot say. I did hear that from Romana. I did hear it from Kathy, from Ron uh, Fletcher, Eve Gentry. I'm not sure if she ever told me that. But certainly Romana did and Kathy Grant did. That he wanted kids to do Pilates. He wanted it in schools. Because I think he realized that a healthy body is a healthy mind. A healthy child is a healthy society. Uh, That's it. That's why I'm such a strong believer that we need to make social statements, not just teach up in our studios. Ryan, so we have, you know, we've come kind of gone full circle in our society and mm, diversifying companies has been meaning more of a inviting more brown and black people into different companies, um, inviting more women. But we know that diversification also means inviting other populations into it. And it's a challenge when we talk about fitness because now we're looking at not only um, inviting 
you know, different ethnicities, but we're looking at inviting different populations into unto themselves. And I'm talking more about um, the physically, and again, I apologize in advance if the term is not correct, um, the physically challenged, um, you know, veterans, people that are, you know, that may have, that may be blind or that may be deaf. These are other areas that we need to expand in for wellness because they need it as, they need it too. So again, I guess my question back to both of you is, how do we create a space that is safe and inclusive, not only for brown and black people, but for other areas in our population that could benefit from wellness? Well, first of all, I, I love the uh, Planet Fitness uh, motto of uh, no judgment zone. Yes, the no judgment zone. The no judgment zone. So that, that, that is, I just love that. I would love to borrow that. <laughs> uh, but, it, you know, we need to create, create a zone that is a non-judgment non zone, meaning anyone and everyone that walks in, in whatever way they are different to the norm, should feel welcome in the environment. That's the first thing. The second thing is I think we need to run courses that specialize in working with special ed, special education, working with the aging population. I'll be teaching a workshop next year called The Power of Aging, working with the aging population so that our students can go out into those communities, work in different homes for the elderly, work with people that are physically challenged, mentally challenged, mm -hmm. work with different populations. It's going to be an outreach. We can't bring everyone here. We need to educate the teachers to go out there. Brian? Yeah. How do you feel about yeah, that? I, um... That's super interesting. That's a great question, Stella, because I think, whew, man, it's loaded just because you know, I, I'm obviously, uh, you know, I, I'm, an, I'm black, right? So my main concern is, is the people that I, that I grew up with. You know, that, that's my main concern. I'm looking at that first because I'm, I'm looking at those um, scenarios and those situations. And a lot of times people take this, especially during this whole movie, that's why it's been great. It's like, it's almost like saying Black Lives Matter. It's like, all lives matter. It's like, yeah, we get it. We get it. We, we, we understand that every single person should be cared for, right? No one's saying that's not true. But at the same time, like, we're, we're having... Um, a systematic problem specifically with this one group you know what i'm saying so so i think that that needs to be addressed inside of the inclusiveness and i think it can be done i don't think it's one or the other black lives matter screw everyone else like, that's ridiculous that's not, that's not no one's saying that right they're saying uplift these people uplift everyone but these people again have been purposely pushed back you know i mean slavery is slavery right i mean th this was not a little thing so financially so so when i think about resources and everything given I, I look at this group of people that is that that literally wasn't able to acquire wealth for 230 years then from that they really weren't able to they weren't able to buy houses in the 50s you know because of redlining i mean we can go on and on you got mass incarceration in 70s and 80s i mean we're literally going on and on even today to, to what we have going on to someone's foot on someone's neck so i get the inclusion of everyone right so i i, I am an, an advocate of that but it is it would be um I need to, you know, I need to focus on 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 what what needs to be done for the specific group that was purposely pushed back as well. And and by saying that, I know again, a lot of people do think that I'm excluding other people by saying that. So by saying to someone, and pardon me if the term isn't correct, you know, a challenge. I'm not sure of the correct term either. So you know, someone physically challenged. By no means am I saying don't think about that person or that person doesn't dissolve or excuse me deserve X, Y, and Z. But at the same time, in this discussion, the height that we're talking about, I just think it's important that we don't lose focus because I think that's what happens all the time. We, we kind of lose focus. We're like, oh, this is screwed up. And then we're like, but everything's screwed up. It's like, yeah, yeah, but we got to focus on this. Just take care of this. And when you take care of that, you'll be taking care of a lot of other things at the same time, right? Because when it's good for black people, then it's going to be good for a lot of other people because the mindset's going to be people need to be treated well, right? Not just black people. It doesn't stop there. The, the slogan isn't just those people, right? But it starts there and then we, we go on. I mean, we have indigenous, we have the, the physically challenged. I mean, we have a lot to work on. So that's a very interesting um, topic for me. So thanks so much for bringing that up because how to navigate in that space without being 
you know, without neglecting one, one group, but, but at the same time saying, now we, we got to take care of this, you know? Yeah, that's, and that's really why I wanted to bring it up because it is challenging and many corporations are finding themselves scrambling. And, I, I, and that's the only word I can, I can come up with with all the research I've been doing is that they're finding themselves scrambling, but at the same time, they're also being faced with a lot of, of I want to say, criticism. Uh, we talked about earlier how it doesn't feel genuine and Bassey feels genuine because it's been what you've been doing. It is you. You grew up that way. But a lot of, you know, corporations, Brian, you mentioned yesterday in our, in our talk that you were going through people's Instagram and you saw the one black square and then nothing else. So it's like, how do, you know, how do we keep, you know, it goes back to my first question. How do we keep the momentum going, keep it in the forefront, and then hold ourselves accountable to keep the change going? We, we know we've got the seed, and we're trying to nurture it. How do we keep watering it and giving it what it needs to keep that, that energy there? Well, well definitely from... From, for myself, definitely conversations like this, you know, that's why I was super excited to be having it because I think just having the dialogue, think about this, we, this kind of dialogue a year and a half ago, right? It's just not as likely. I mean, maybe with you, Rail, it's hard because maybe with the things that you were trying to open up, but normally speaking, I mean, you know, there's no black dots or black lives. No one cared about that. As a matter of fact, if you said black lives matter, trust me, I know if you said it, you were literally an outcast. You were a cop killer. You were the worst thing on the world. Now it's like the most, like you say, you know, you got it in your shirt, everyone's wearing it. So it's, it's, it wasn't always this way. The progress is awesome right now that, that we're making, to be honest with you. Just because we are able to have this conversation, people are going to be like, this is weird. You know, they're going, oh, this is normal. This is kind of like what happens now, you know? Yeah, I, I, I couldn't agree with you more, Brian, that uh, we, we have moved things forward. We have moved the needle. Now we need to keep those conversations going. Brian's passion is Black Lives Matter. I, I'm passionate about, you know, whatever I'm passionate about. My, my, my mother, her whole life was devoted to physically and mentally challenged uh, mm. individuals, not just children, adults as well. I know I didn't have what she, I don't have what she had. That was her passion. And, you know, I've had a different passion. So we've all got to work in our lane, mm -hmm. but acknowledge that we're all together moving the needle, all together. Brian, I've got to tell a funny story. Uh, when we moved to this building right here in uh, 2017, Brian was kind enough to come and help us. Yes. Because I said, Latoya, you've got to bring Brian. I need help. <laughs> so Brian and I were driving around in a U-Haul <laughs> in 2017. Brian, you remember this. And I said to Brian, Brian, can you get me a Black Lives Matter t-shirt? And Brian uh, kind of laughed because he thought I was kidding and I said no serious I'm not just saying it because I want to where I, I really want to belong to this movement and I told Brian a bit about my history and it was just a really cool moment because it was just authentic <laughs> Brian looked at me like you know he he thought maybe I was coming from a different place yes. yeah. and uh, since then Brian thank you for providing me with the t-shirt and uh, I wear it proudly, but I think Brian's so right in what he says that it can't just be, okay, I've got a t-shirt, now I'm finished, now I belong to the cause. No, no, you don't. You've got to work. You've got to work every day, every night at it to move that needle, to move society as a whole. Last night I was watching Don Lemon on CNN, and Don Lemon who, for those who don't know, is an African-American man, and he is a gay man. And he was interviewing the governor of Colorado, mm -hmm. who is a gay man. And he finished the interview, and he said, wow, wow, things have changed. He said, it's not that long ago that I came out. It was only like five years ago or something. And he said, here I am on national TV. I'm just interviewing a gay governor of a state and it seems completely normal and both of us are just talking and I'm interviewing him and people are watching and we've moved the needle. I, I was so happy. I mean, to see Don and this, uh, the governor of Colorado talking, 
You know, it, it didn't seem unnatural. He was asking about the first husband, which is this man's uh, husband. Uh, and I just thought it was fantastic. I think as a society, most days I feel we're moving the needle. There are days <laughs> I cannot be disingenuous <laughs> where I feel in our environment today, I've got to be honest, I feel that sometimes that people are struggling to push that needle back. They're struggling to push that needle back. And no, we cannot let that happen. We have got to keep it as a society. And we'll all have our own passions, but we've got to keep it moving forward. Ryan, I noticed, um, and I, don't, I mean not noticing, but as, as, an, as a woman of color, I find a lot of times that when I'm speaking to um, my brothers and sisters, that the level of patience is very short for change. I don't know, it's very, it's almost like a short fuse. It's like, um, and, and sometimes I, I have to admit I lose patience with it because I think, well, this is really easy. Why can't we just do that? Um, words of advice, I mean, I'm, I'm looking for comfort, I guess, because it is, it can be very frustrating working in some systems. And I know that it, in my heart, I feel like, why, why, why is this such a struggle? Why is it so hard to just say, okay, we can't do this anymore. We're moving to do this. For, for me, that just reminds me, I, I was just reading before we came out here, I was uh, listening to Warren Buffett, and he was saying, no one wants to get rich slow. And, it, and it, the analogy that I'm bringing that up, or why I'm bringing that up is because, you know, it's going to take time, you know, and I, you know, I'm super impatient too. You know how, you know, we are overdue. I can go on and on, right? We, 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 but at the end of the day, it's going to take time, you know, like this isn't the type of needle that's going to just wrap this way, you know, it's going to, it's going to take time. And I, I don't want to hear that personally. And I know a lot of other people don't, but when I think about all the great progresses in my life, the fitness journey, right. You know, just my emotional journey, my spiritual journey, there was ups and, you know, there was rough times, bad times, but it went up in slow increments. You know, it wasn't like one day I was like, Oh my God, I feel good. You know, it's like, it, 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 you know, it, it's your life, right. You're constantly just trying to go up almost like a stock. That's why I was bringing up the Warren Buffett. Just kind of keep that steady increase, right. Like, because it's not going to be, you know, tomorrow everything has changed. You know how long it's going to take to unravel those, all those systems that I was saying to put in place to stop people? Think about how long it took to put in place. So it's going to, I'm, I'm ready for the long fight. And I would encourage people to think of it that way, right? This is a marathon. We're, we're mile 83, right? So we, we get a long, you know, we're, we're exhausted and we got a ways to go, right? So it, it's just that type of mentality I think that we have to have. That's what helps me because I don't even see an end, right? I'm just forward, forward. Forward, forward. That's the way I see it, personally. Personally. Yeah, I couldn't agree with you more, Brian. It, it is, it, 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 it's not a quick fix. Mm -hmm. You know, and I use the analogy of Pilates. We say it to our students all the time. You don't come to this course and suddenly you know Pilates and you're a teacher, and, <laughs> and that's it. It is a lifelong pursuit. It's not a quick fix, and it's changing all the time. And so we say that to our students. And, you know, it, it brings me back to South Africa. Listening to uh, Roy uh, and reading his book about South Africa in the, in the uh, middle of the, uh, of the 20th century, you know, 1940s, 1950s, the uh, 60s, apartheid was so strong. And you look at South Africa today, you know, Nelson Mandela, who thought that he'd get out of prison and the people would be emancipated and there would be equality. And South Africa has its problems and it has its struggles, but it took years. And look where it is today. The needle moved. But if people like Nelson Mandela wouldn't have had that patience, 26, seven years in prison, that's patience. <laughs> that is just watching, watching, dripping, dripping, dripping. Yeah, and it happens one drop at a time. And Le Sedi Le Bota, Le Sedi Le Bota, that is what we're going to be going back and giving money, helping, giving resources. They found a partner in us. It's about just moving it slowly, slowly forward. You can't be impatient with those things. I'm an impatient person by nature. Brian strikes me as someone very impatient. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, so, we, Brian and I share that, but both of us know that this is a marathon, it's not a sprint. 
Right. There's a, some new terms that have come up out of this, and one of them is ally, ally, finding an ally, an allyship. I believe that's the term. Can you explain that to me? So just in terms of allyship? Yes, allyship. Yeah, it's, it's, that's, that's what's been the most um, encouraging for me. That, that's why I know things have changed, because um, other people besides Black people care about this now. You know, that, that's just simply the, the shift. So the allies, you know, have, have been there. They're coming out like, no, this is wrong. I mean, you know, that's what it's going to take. You know, obviously we think it's wrong. We've been screaming it for years, you know what I'm saying? I mean, but that, you know, deaf ears, right? But now we have support. We have support now. So you know what? Those guys are right. You know, th this, this ain't fair, you know? So now that's why it's real to me now. That's why the needle is definitely changing because we have the support of our colleagues, right? Of every, the human race saying, wait, this is wrong. Yeah. So that, that uh, allyship, um, yeah, that, that's what I see it as. And that, that's why I'm so um, optimistic because the, we, we have allyship. Yeah, it's, a, it's in really, you know, I'm excited about that term and I'm really excited that we do have these allies. I mean, um, even King, Dr. King had allies. And, of course. You know, and that helped, you know, move the civil rights movement forward to get the Civil Rights Act available for us so that we could vote. So it's, it's, it is important that we have these allies to help keep the message out and keep it moving forward. Did you guys know that in 2040, the majority of the United States workforce will be a diverse ethnicity? I did. I did know that. I did know that. So this is something that, you know, when we talk about wellness and how the fitness industry needs to change, we need to look at that labor force, how that's going to be changing in the future, because that is the foundation. That is going to be our future where we're pulling our resources and, and getting the talent into our industry. So do we have any questions, Karina? Any comments? I want to just say one thing about allyship, yes. and that is that None of us can do anything alone. We need, want to do something, we need allies. We need a Bassi. Bassi, let's look right at Bassi. I could never do it without you, without the hundreds of people, thousands of people out there, every single day. So we can't, from our simple individual lives to our businesses, to society as a whole, we cannot do it alone. We need allies. And we need to lend our voice to different causes. And going back to Black Lives Matter, just before we take a question, it's amazing how it's changed. Because when, uh, just a few months ago, the, when, when George Floyd happened and, and there was this resurgence of attention to Black Lives Matter, and at that time you would hear so much of this, well, all lives matter, all lives matter. You don't hear it as much. Because people are now getting the message. It's not that they're saying black lives, that any life, other life doesn't matter or that all lives don't matter. Of course all lives matter equally. But these people, this group has been pushed down, suppressed. And we're saying they matter. We matter. Black lives matter. And I think that question is asked less and less now. Mm -hmm. And that's a good thing because we've moved it forward. We've moved the conversation forward, even in these six months. Yeah, that's, months. that is encouraging to hear that that's happening, because again, you're talking about small steps. Yeah. And we have to acknowledge the small steps in moving that needle and right. patience. And I'm a Taurus, and I'm supposed to be patient. Mm -hmm. But again, sometimes I, I it just, like everybody else, up and down, up and down. Just keep yeah, the just eye on the I mean, I'm a news addict, so I'm always listening. And I don't hear that question anymore. I don't hear that rhetoric anymore. That, well, all lives matter. What do you mean black lives matter? All lives matter. You don't hear that as much anymore. I think people are getting it. I, I hope. I, I may be optimistic, but I hope so. Yes, I have a question. Yeah. Questions are coming in from the audience to our moderator. What's the question? Hi guys, I had a question. Oh, Latoya, Latoya, Latoya! Hey! <laughs> well, it's more, it's 
more like a statement. And I want to preface this by saying that like I'm completely biased. Um, but Stella, in the beginning of the session, you asked the question, um, like, how do you make the scholarships, specifically the Kathy Grant scholarship that Bassi Pilates is offering, mm -hmm. not seem like a handout? Um, and I know for a fact, this is not just a black thing, but any person of color knows that in order to do anything and get equal pay or equal respect as our heterosexual white male counterparts, we have to do it 150 times better. Mm -hmm. Bassi Pilates education, this is where my dis disclaimer comes in, is the best of the best, you know what I'm saying? Nice. So you're not just saying, here's money to go learn. This is this is how you're going to be the best in your field, you know? Uh, we're offering mentorship and, um, and um, guidance after. It's not just one and done, we're paying for it and you're gone. You literally become a part of the Bassey family and uh, you become the best in the field, you know? I, I read all of so many comments and everyone comes into Bassey because their best Pilates instructor was a Bassey Pilates mm -hmm. instructor. So that's why I don't feel it feel that it's not the monetary value at all. It's the fact that you're going to be the best in your field. I just wanted to throw that out there. I love that. <laughs> wow. Thanks, Latoya. Thank you, Latoya. Appreciate it. Appreciate it. Wow. Um, Brian, I'm going to let you start, I guess. You know, can, the question, can you repeat the question? I, I was near one part. Yeah, it was. What are the practical ways to really start to move forward? To move the needle move forward. The needle forward systemically. What are practical ways to move the needle forward systemically? So how do we create systemic change? Yeah. And I, I always point to the top because that, that's where it starts and ends, you know, Rail, you know that. I mean, so, you know, we got to create the culture where we're thinking about this. We're mindful. You just made such a great point, Rail, about that. Thank you so much for bringing that up about the Black Lives Matter, about All Lives Matter, and how you don't hear it anymore. I mean, just little things like that. So that, that's progress. You know, at office places, I know mine. You know, I get questions. You know, we'll be in a Zoom uh, meeting or anything like that, and someone will say, hey, was that insensitive? And, I'm like, you know, two years ago, that never would have been asked, you know, but just creating these cultures where we're being sensitive about the people around us and we're thinking, right? How are we, are we seeing anyone? Am I doing everything I can to be inclusive? Things like that. So that, I always start at the top and just trying to create cultures from the top. Yes, I, I, I agree with Brian 100%. Systemic change is, is, a, is a very difficult thing. And um, <clears throat> certainly starting at the top is, is, a, is an excellent way to do it. And, and that's why you know we're trying to get all the time the, the government to change, the the uh, Congress to change, uh, <laughs> pass laws, pass regulations that will bring about change. But we also have to do it at a grassroots level, the way we live our lives, just being good to people, respectful to all people, all people always respect people. Everyone deserves respect, whether they uh, you know whatever position they hold in life, mm -hmm. uh, they, whatever their station is in life, they deserve respect, dignity, speak in a, in a nice way. That's how we start bringing about change. It sounds so simple. It just, you know, when, when, when uh, the janitorial people walk in here, I always take a moment to speak to them. How are you? You know, are you... Doing okay, you know, just speak people that you, we order food at a lot. <laughs> yeah. We order food out a lot. So when they bring it to the door, I try to have a little conversation with them. Just these little things make people uh, feel, wow, we're not lesser. We are the same. We happen to be doing another job, but we are the same. And I think that's how we move the needle. Each one of us in our own lives. How we walk our talk. That is how we move the needle at a grassroots level. But of course, Brian is correct that these big changes, these big systemic changes come from the top. Yeah, um, a lot of the articles I've read have, have echoed exactly what both of you have said. 
that in order for any change to happen, whether it's in our government or in our corporations or organizations, it comes from the top. The top is the one that sets the tone for everything else that happens. And if the, if the top is not buying into it, then no one else in the company or the organization is going to buy into it. So that's, you know, that's, you're just echoing exactly again. But also it is local change. Every little step that we do as, as a human being is what is going to make that difference. And yes, Brian, I've been on many conversations like you where someone will say something and then they turn around and go, is that wrong? Am I being, you know, am I being offensive? And it's interesting because that never, that would never happen, number one, but also as a woman, um, even when we were talking about equal rights for women, you never heard that happening. You know, no man would ever turn around and go, did I offend you? You know, but now that it's reached this level of um, social awareness, it's starting to be part of that conversation. And people want to learn, and people are willing to learn. And I think that's also um, what happened with this movement coming around. I don't want to say a second time, but a re you know, coming around again is that people really want to learn how to do better and what it means to be better. Can I, can I speak to the, I just want to be really clear about, thank you for mentioning the grassroots rail. I mean, coming from, coming from me, right? I mean, grassroots is super important. But what I'm seeing is, you know, I, I just read on movements, right? I read on movements all over the world. Movements, 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 grassroots, 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 and I love it. I'm part of the grassroots, the, the grassroots. But what I'm learning is the grassroots is kind of, don't get me wrong, I love being a part of the grassroots, but it's kind of a necessity. Like people are in this grassroots because they have to, we need each other, right? So we're doing this because, not, not because we don't want to, don't get me wrong, but it, there's also a necessity in it as well. I think it has to be the type of thing where the top is thinking that way as well, that it's a necessity, right? Because they don't have the, they don't need it as much. They're good in their own, they're good where they are, right? They don't really need to change anything. So I think, I think the grassroots is, is great. I, I didn't want to, to belittle that as well, but I think we've seen a history of grassroots coming and the top just kind of beating it down, right? So we are making this progress, but right now, I think we need the progress of the top moving and the grassroots moving it up as well. We, we can't have this, this thing anymore. That's where we are. We keep hitting this because we might get a little way and then it just comes back, right? It goes a little way, it comes back, you know? Now, now you know, it's, it's again, actually, you can march in the streets based on racism. Like this literally came back. You know what I'm saying? Because because I, I think there's there's been this um, acceptance at the top. There's been there's been sort of like acceptance that this, this this is what what can happen. So I think that the grassroots is awesome. I never want to take the focus on that, but it's like we need a little help. <laughs> we need some help from the top now. They got to bend. Definitely, definitely. So then, how do we influence the top? How do we influence the top? Is the next question because we all agree it has to start from the top. So what does that look like? Well, you know, uh, part of it is voting. Uh, you know, I, I know that we are uh, vote fatigue, <laughs> but the fact is, you know, I take the lead from one of the greatest men uh, that, that I know of all time, and that is Barack Obama. He is such an eloquent, uh, good, decent, wonderful man, and he speaks so eloquently about the importance of voting. We need to have our voice heard, and uh, voting is incredibly important. That's how you bring about uh, change in a democratic society, and that's what we live in, is a democratic society. Now, you know, you have heads of organizations also, not just government, uh, but also organizations, and that is we need to bring about change in the organizations. And that starts from, yeah, we're an education company. We're educating. As educators, uh, how we treat people is part of our education. It's not just how to do the hundred. It's that each person's an individual. And each person, it's not just clumping people together in a group and do the same thing. No, each person's an individual. That's always been taught in Massey, that you need to see people as individuals. Yeah, um... So again, we're at that moment where it's all about holding ourselves accountable, holding our industry accountable, and voting. Because even in our industry, we can vote. We can change things. Um, we can meet with legislation. But it all starts back, and I, don't, and I know Brian hates that word grassroots, because 
we are looking at making local change to affect global change. And so we want to understand what we can do locally to, to move the needle more globally. I mean, it's great we have the awareness. Everybody's all everybody's there. But now what are the, the steps? I mean, we have, you know, we have Bassey, we have you. Um, you know, we have other schools that are kind of trying to find their way through this. And we what the Bassey has done has always been organic. And that's, that's why I'm here, because I believe it's, it's organic, it's authentic, it doesn't feel um, fake or disingenuous at all. You've been doing it. This is your walk, this is your talk, you've been doing it. But how do we help other people in our industry kind of join this conversation and keep it moving forward? It's one thing, when I, and what I'm trying to avoid is everybody going in their own little bubble because of their schools, and then... No one's still, we're never really reaching out to get ourselves as a community moving forward. Yeah, well, uh, you know, I, I think uh, in, in, there may be a silver lining to uh, what is happening, and that's that it may bring more Pilates schools and Pilates organizations together uh, under a completely different umbrella as to what is the breathing pattern you use on the teaser? Uh, you know, I mean, you know, it does sound so ridiculous, but I've sat in many a meeting and many a conference where, you know, people get so uh, emotional about whether it's an inhale or an exhale. But maybe uh, this will allow Pilates as an industry to refocus, to recalibrate, and to come together about a completely different discussion. Mm -hmm. And um, going back to Brian, I just want to say one thing for Brian, and that is, I think Brian really loves the grassroots and praises grassroots. And so Brian, I just wanted to correct Stella. <laughs> I know you don't hate the grassroots. <laughs> I didn't mean that you hate them, I'm sorry. <laughs> no, no, Brian is, Brian and I are grassroots people, but Brian is absolutely right. If you don't change the top, the top comes down to push you down all the time. Mm -hmm. So, but going back to our industry, we need to create forums. Stella, you're on the board of the PMA. That's one of the forums, uh, you know, to, to bring, find commonality and stop, you know, arguing about breath patterns and start finding a way to move us forward as an industry together. And uh, so, you know, that's one of the ways because even in our industry, there is not everyone is equal. It's not enough representation. It's not enough. I don't want to say that not everyone is equal because I, I think by and large in our industry, uh, people have respect for others, but there's not enough representation of certain segments of the population. So we need dialogue. How do we go out to those underrepresented, under, underrepresented uh, populations make them part of the um, conversation and then part of the industry. Yeah, um, well, I rest assured that I'm using my, my seat um, for on the board with the PMA to bring these concerns up and to push the needle forward. Um, we're looking at diversity, not only um, for black and brown, but also for LBGBQ. I know I said that probably wrong, mm -hmm. But um, we're looking for that. We're looking at how to teach to others. But again, it is about getting the representation there. And they've, they've made a step, and now we just need to keep pushing the needle and taking more steps. And it is, and Brian, this is why I asked that question about patience, because this is where that patience needs to come in. It is, it's, it's kind of, I want to say, teaching. Um, a new choreography. It's like learning a new Pilates style, but it's, an, it's a new way for having the organization to think. Um, so I, I put the question in the chat and it, it seems like you guys kind of touched on um, quite a bit because my, my question in the chat was just, if we're pointing to the top of the Pilates industry specifically, are we even looking to the PMA anymore? Or are we looking to the heads of our school like rail? And when we look to hold ourselves accountable or to self-regulate our industry, who is on the line to actually do that? Like who is able to hold someone's feet to the fire? Because when they err, we, we saw an example of a hate crime in our industry 
and there's no justice to that. We, like, who is on the line to that individual as a teacher maybe losing their certification? Like, is that an appropriate step? When it comes to Bazi as a school um, separately, is there a code of ethics that's out there that if you knew a teacher you had trained crossed, do you have anything that outlines what you would do about that within the school, much less within our industry um, and in our industry, if not Bazi, who? Wow. Uh, you, thank you for that amazing question. If uh, you know, I'll I'll step in. You know, I, I I was one of the founding board members of the PMA, and and the PMA has you know had its 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 long history. Uh, but uh, I I I cannot talk for the PMA, although you ask a very legitimate question. You know, who is our the body? I think the PMA is the closest to that body that would guide this community, but you're absolutely correct. There was a you know, terrible uh, incident within our community. And you know, there've probably been others that we haven't heard of uh, or weren't publicized quite as much. And what tools do we have what, to, in a way, um, take action for what was committed? I found it terrible. I spoke out against it. But what can really be done? You know, the, the PMA have uh, the, the tools to a point, but they also have their limitations as to what they can do legally. So, uh, you know, it's, it's a very good question, very difficult one, but you have put a challenge in front of me, and I promise you that I'm gonna rise to the challenge because we have values in our organization, very simple. Passion, compassion, and excellence. And we teach how to behave as teachers, but we don't have a written code of ethics, and we don't have a written uh, guidelines or, or, or rules, regulations of what we would do if something like that happened within Bassey. I think I would know what my instinct would be, uh, it would be very harsh, my response to something like that. But we need a legal leg to stand on. So you have uh, put a challenge in front of me, and I need to do better, because after 32 years, Bassey, uh, in that way, you know, it's kind of been almost oral law. <laughs> it's passed down through the generations how we behave, but in today's world, that's not good enough. So I will, uh, you can check in a while, give me a little bit of time, but we will have a code of ethics, we will have bylaws, and we will have ways of dealing with people, and probably it will be taking away, if we can, I'm, I will check into it legally, taking away their BASI qualification, but I need to check whether there, there, there's so many legal barriers, and I know uh, that the PMA really, I think, tried to do their best, but they, they had, you know, they're also boxed in in certain ways that they can't just act as each individual may have wanted to do, act, but organizations have all kinds of restraints and uh, restrictions. But I will do better for you, 100%. Any other questions? Jesus, thank you very much. Ah. <laughs> um, no questions, just everyone says it's very important to talk about this. Okay, Stella, no further questions? Well then, um, I hope you guys will continue the conversation in our social media. We do have another event coming up in January, and we're going to be going deeper. Um, today was just like an introduction. And I want to, first of all, thank Bassey for giving me this platform and allowing me the space to have these conversations. It's very important to me, and I've always wanted to help move socially, have social change. So I'm very appreciative for that. Thank you. Um, 
Don't forget to join us on Friday, and I'm going to pass that back to Rail. <laughs> le sedi le bato. Le sedi le la bato. Le sedi la bato. Le sedi la bato. I've got, I said it wrong again earlier, but I think I've got it now. And forgive me, I mean, it. it uh, my tongue would say these You're words tired. so You've been easily, talking all day. But I have been talking for many hours today. Uh, please join us. It's the most incredible uh, organization. Uh, we will have uh, much uh, to say about them. We'll have their links up. The Sedi La Bato. And uh, they do incredible work raising women, empowering women. Please join us on Friday for a math class and a Q&A. And we, we'll have more discussions like this. Yes. And, of course, if you want to donate for the Kathy Grant Scholarship, please feel free. Um, you can just go to the link and, um, and donate for that. Also, if you want to donate for La Sede, oh, my Lord. I am Lobato. Lobato. And I used to have a good tongue with language, too. Um, you, you, you don't feel obligated to come. We'd love to have you participate. But again, your dollars are going towards a very worthwhile um, organization, empowering women, helping women in South Africa uplift themselves and provide, and also making social change for South Africa. And again, please, thank you again. We appreciate you joining us, and we love to hear more of the conversations. Thank you. Thank, thank you, you Rail, and thank you, Brian. Oh my God, <laughs> Brian, thank you so much for your time and your input, and we hope to see you again in January when we do this again. Forward to it. Thank you for having me. Thank you, my brother. Love, I love being with you on a panel. Yeah, I love it. Thank you.